Hey guys, I'm here today to talk about my favourite reads of 2019. I always find these videos really fun to do because obviously it's lovely to talk about books that you love, but I also find it quite high pressure because trying to articulately and concisely convince you guys of why you should pick these books up is difficult. But I'm going to try anyway. So recently I've noticed that lots of people managed to rank their books in these videos. I find that absolutely amazing and it's something I could never do. I just know that like my opinion could change daily and I love all these books all so much that yeah I don't know I just, I just couldn't do it. I also find it particularly hard because I've mixed fiction and non-fiction I think it's much easier to rank books if they're similar. So for example I think if I had top five fantasy books I probably could rank them against one another but to have a list like this to rank them just seems impossible to me. So what I will say is that in general I think the non-fiction books were better. So if I had to say like the half of this list was better than the other half I'd say all the non-fiction take the top five spot and the fiction take from six to nine. Does that make sense? So I'm going to talk about the fiction first. I'm going to start off with the one that I didn't actually give five stars to initially and that is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Everisto. So you've probably heard about this on loads of people's videos because obviously this sort of co-won um, the Man Booker Prize recently. I'm not interested in the Man Booker Prize at all. Um, I don't think they tend to choose a long list that really fits my tastes but I had heard about this book from Simon over at Savage Reads prior to that and he absolutely raved about it and told me he thought I would love it and he was so right and I was so glad I took his advice and I was really happy to see it on the long list and really happy um, to see it win you know um, even though it didn't win as I think it should have done. So if you don't know which I'm sure you do by now this is written by Bernadine Everisto and this is mainly focused on um, black British women and all of these women are somehow linked. So this is a set of I think four trios and each trio is a mother, a daughter and someone who's linked to them. And they're always told in a different order. So sometimes you start with the daughter, sometimes the mother, sometimes the person who's linked to them. And what I said in my um, sort of wrap up video where I mentioned this, which I will link down below. So beneath each titles of these books, I'll also link the video where I spoke about them if you want to hear more. I love books where you see a complex situation in which nobody's perfect and you sympathise with a certain character and are frustrated at another character on their behalf but then when you, the story's flipped and you see it from the other person's perspective you feel exactly the same but the other way around. I think to manage characters in that way is really intelligent and takes a lot of precision and she does that beautifully. Now the reason I didn't give this 5,000 initially is because I felt that the first two trios of stories really sang to me and I still really enjoyed the last two but just not as much. I think in hindsight perhaps I just wasn't in a great a reading mood when I read the last two so I definitely want to go back and reread this because it's really stuck with me. I think it's such a celebration of women, um, in particular like I said this focuses on um, black British women, most of the stories are based in the UK and whilst a lot of them are focused in um, London, some of them aren't and some of them are set in the north, um, there's a vast array of ages and lifestyles of these women and I just adored it and I definitely want to go and read her other books so it, it deserves all the praise it's getting and you know I'd highly recommend it. So another one I have here is Always You Adina by V.G. Lee. This is my like catnip type of book, right? It is a coming of age story that follows a young girl, Tick. It is set in um, a working class British family, Tick. And it is a really slow character focused novel, Tick. I love those three things. Basically if a book has those three things, it's it almost has to set out to fail if you know what I mean like it's it's already won in my book but this was so exquisitely written so I saw this in Gaze the Word because I never heard of VG Lee and um, she it looks like she's always published by indie presses and I saw this cover and it really pulled me in as soon as I read about it on the back I really wanted to pick it up um, so this is set in um, the mid 1960s in Birmingham and we follow a young girl called Bonnie and she lives with her mother and father she's an only child but her aunt is very much involved in um, their family's life. Her aunt seems to have some sort of unusual relationship with her father. Um, they're not brother and sister, she's married to her father's brother. And she is 
in love with her aunt. Her aunt is described as almost like this Marilyn Monroe type beauty and in comparison to her, to Bonnie's mother, who comes across as quite meek and drab um, and complaining a lot from Bonnie's perspective as a child, um, it's really interesting to watch the roles these two women play through a child's eyes and the the secrets and lies behind who the Aunt Adina really is, which is revealed throughout the novel. This is just a beautiful slow story and um, it's got some, some really sad moments, it has moments of, um, of abuse in particular, which I, um, you know, I should probably mention, but I love this and if you like slow stories focused on young girls, it really really brilliantly explores um, class then I'd highly recommend this, I really loved it and I'm definitely going to read um, everything else that she has written. And the next one is The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing by Mira Jacob. I absolutely loved this book, obviously, hence it being on this list. So this is around 500 pages with quite small font, which sounds quite long for a literary fiction story, but actually I really sped through this. This is one of those books that when you describe it, it sounds like it can't have beautiful language or amazing character development because it has so many themes. When I hear books described like this I always think but how do you have all those themes and handle it with subtlety and tact? This book really does and in that sense it reminds me of books like Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. You know that book has beautiful language, phenomenally developed characters but it handles so many social themes, it has a lot of social commentary. Um, so if you enjoy that sort of book I think you'll really enjoy this. So this is set across a couple of timelines. It starts in 1998 and we're following um, Amina who I think is you know around her 30s. She gets a phone call from her mother saying that her father appears to be very ill. Um, he's a brain surgeon and he's started to talk to himself a lot and his colleagues have also started to notice some oddities. And so her mother, Kamala, calls her home and says, can you come home and, and help um, look after your father? I mean, they live in different um, cities in the US, so she travels across to to go and see how he is. And then we go back in time to when they're going to visit their family in India. And you find out right at the start of the novel in the past section that there was a big family fallout in India which led to um, a really awful um, moment in the family's history. And you know that the grandmother is no longer alive but also the son, so our main character's brother, is no longer alive. So you have these two time points. One is the past where you're building up from them being very young to them being teenagers and the moment of his death and, and the, the why, like how did that happen? And then also the, the present in 1998 of um, her father being ill and him not really acknowledging that and part of il his illness being that he um, he can't let go of the past and he can't let go of these people he's lost. This is exquisitely written, it handles so many topics with grace. I loved the exploration of her parents, I thought it was done so deftly. Uh, honestly this is, yeah, all those words like subtlety, um, you know, grace, like tact, it's just, it, it handles everything with, with, with precision and the social commentary is phenomenal and um, there's there's lots of really interesting commentary in particular on um, when a family leaves their home country to build a better life and how that makes them perceived in the eyes of the family they've left behind you know how there's this pride and um, ability to brag about the fact that your children have gone to le lead this better life but also this shame in the fact that your children have gone to lead this better life and they've left you behind and you're not enough for them to stay for and also do they really love their country anymore if they don't want to live in it and I think that th that as well as so many other um, conversations were handled excellently so yeah I'd really recommend this thought it was phenomenal and I'll read any other book that she brings out. So the next book I want to talk about is actually part of a series so I'm not going to talk too much about it and it is Son of the Shadows by Juliet Marillia. So this is part of a historical fantasy romance series and it was originally written as a trilogy and then later on Juliet Marillia added a second trilogy onto the end. So how the first trilogy works is in the first book we follow Sirica and she is um, the daughter of Seven Waters and she has um, lots of brothers and it follows the fairy tale of um, you know when the brothers are turned into swans and she has to um, knit them these coats to wear to make them not be swans anymore so you follow um, that adapted fairy tale and the rest of these are you know there's allusions to fairy tales but then they're, they're original stories you can't sort of predict the ending based on knowing um, how the fairy tale worked 
all of them are really heavily focused on um, there being you know a romantic element but all of these women are um, you know really independent and have their own storylines. Sun of the Shadows was amazing just as good as the first book if not perhaps a bit better it has lots of feminist commentary which I really enjoyed the main character is super strong-willed, um, there's loads of twists and turns in the plot. These are big chunky books and um, they're not really fast-paced fantasy, they are the sort of slow-burning fantasy with lots of beautiful writing, loads of uh, descriptions of nature and of lots of characters um, and really slow relationships build between characters. I absolutely love this, I was in the edge of my seat. I listened to this on audiobook which I highly recommend, it's beautifully narrated and I was just lying on the sofa just to, to listen to it, doing nothing else, having to know what happened. Um, and for such a big book, I think I listened to it in like a day or two because I just needed to get through it. So it's absolutely glorious, it's really romantic and I highly recommend it. And if you're unsure of reading fantasy, I think Juliet Marillier's books are a good in because they're not super fantastical. Like the, the fantasy is to do with like fairy tale folklore. Um, there isn't like, you know, people who can do magic and stuff like that. So um, I really recommend them. So now we're on to the non-fiction. And firstly, I have a repeat author on the list and that is Mira Jacobs. This is Good Talk and Memoir and Conversations. And this is a graphic memoir. I've shown this um, a couple of times before on the channel because it is fantastic. But how it's set out is like this. So she takes actual photos or images and she overlays those photos or images with um, like paper doll cutouts that she's drawn of her family and friends and then speech bubbles. And the speech bubbles are just conversations, right? So there isn't like loads of um, action lines like and then so and so walked here. It's just their conversations that overlay these images. And this was amazing so the the premise of this it opens with her young son asking her if he's black or white he's just realized that michael jackson was born black but you know was seen as white in the media for the vast majority of his career and so he's, he's confused about what that means for him and she has to explain to him that he's neither of those things in fact he's brown because um, she's indian american and his father is um white jewish and she knows that those two things are, are difficult things to to hold together as a child and she she finds these conversations difficult and so this book really is all about difficult conversations she has with her son, with her husband, with her own parents and, and particularly with her in-laws who um, you find out throughout the course of the book voted for Donald Trump and how that makes her feel and the conversations, the dialogue she tries to start with them surrounding that. It is absolutely brilliant and everything I can say for her novel I can say for this. It has so many themes and they're all handled with subtlety, with grace, with nuance and they're all so articulate. You never feel like there's too many themes, you never feel like she's glossed over anything and what she does you know perfectly in both of them is she gives you these things to think about, right? These really complex issues, but she ties them to real events, to real people. And I think having context for any large issues makes it so much more easy to relate to and to empathise with, even if it's really distant from your own life. And something that I found really interesting is I listened to her talk, and I think it was the Reading Woman podcast. She mentioned the fact that she never changes the facial expressions on her um, dolls so they're all quite expressionless and she said the reason she did that was because she wanted to, to not um, give you as the reader like an out so that the the characters had to carry the emotions and you didn't have to so by making them expressionless she forces you to think how how you would feel in that situation or how you think they must have felt and it forces you to think more deeply about it which is something when you're reading you don't really like articulate you don't really think about but as soon as she says it you're like oh yeah that's so true it really did make me do that so yeah absolutely loved it you have to read it then we have a couple more books that i don't have copies of because i either listened to them on audio or got them out from the library and that book is how we fight for our lives by saeed jones this is beautiful this is a very short audio book i think it was around five or six hours and i think saeed jones is a poet i haven't read any of his poetry but i certainly want to get hold of it now and you can really tell he's a poet I listened to this on audiobook and he narrated it himself. I'd really recommend that. It's an awkward one because I loved it on audio. I think he narrated it beautifully. It sounded like almost musical. But I also think that, you know, I lost something in not having it in print and being able to like pause and reread sections that I loved. Although I did um, quite often like rewind to re-listen to sections. So I definitely want to own this in print and reread it very soon. 
So this is about the fact um, that Saeed Jones was raised by his um, single black mother in the US and it's a love letter to her really but as well as it being a love letter to her it's about how he survives living in the US as a black gay man. We hear all these stories in the press about um, black boys, black men who are um, attacked, who are shot um, a lot of the time by police for nothing other than being a black boy or man. So he knows that he's in danger because of that and that's something his mother really tries to embed in him to make him aware of. But he also knows that as a gay man he's a target and what he articulates beautifully is that things that people don't understand they tend to fear. A certain type of person does that anyway. And so he knows that a lot of the time he's feared by others and because of that fear they want to hurt him. This memoir does not shy away from anything, okay? So if you don't like reading about um, sex, about people sort of harming themselves in certain ways, you, you may want to avoid this one. I think it was beautifully honest and I think it's really worth reading. There's sections where he talks about how when he goes to university he gets involved with having sex with lots of people in dangerous circumstances really and he does it to hurt himself because he feels so lonely and um, he never really talks to his mother properly about the fact that he's gay and that's um, this thing he can't get past and it's beautifully executed. There's a there's a section which actually I, I've watched him in quite a few talks on YouTube since then because I wanted to hear him talk more about the book um, and I'll link a video down below where he does a reading from the book because uh, I'd really recommend watching that if you want to get a snippet. Um, and that reading was uh, one of the you know really excellent sections of the book because it's about how he sees this um, young white man at a college party and he wants to have sex with him. And he describes this um, young white guy as, as the goddamn everyman. Like he articulates everything about America. Um, he's the our ideal of like um, this white college bound boy who probably has some sort of sports scholarship and probably comes from wealth. And he can move through life making lots of mistakes, but he'll still somehow um, be above the majority of others and how he wants to like eat him whole, how he wants to consume him and that's how he sees as a way to survive by, by hurting himself, by like consuming these other people that actually make him feel awful about himself. It is like amazing, it made me think so much. I really, really want more people to pick it up so I highly recommend it. And the next one is Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls by T. Kira Madden. Again, I'm gonna link below um, an interview I watched her do on YouTube where she does a reading from the book. It is amazing. It's one of the funnier sections. So this book is a memoir in essays and it's not told in chronological order like the, the previous memoir I just spoke about. It, it jumps around. And the essay collection is sort of split into a few different themes and one being a section all about her mother, one being a section about her father and another being a section about her teenage years. So Tika and Madam was raised initially by her mother and her father was already married with two sons. He left his first wife to marry her mother so from quite a young age he was then a big part of their lives. Her father was involved in um, lots of like illegal like stock market things and um, so they were incredibly incredibly wealthy but lots of her family got in a lot of trouble so it's this story of immense privilege which she's very aware of and she articulates brilliantly whilst also really not being well being all right being really privileged in terms of wealth being completely loved by her family but not really being cared for in the way she needed to be cared for so her parents are drug users, um, they're alcoholics and they hurt one another. There's lots of domestic abuse in this book and they neglect her quite severely. So this book is like a love letter to both of her parents in that they do awful things to her. They let her down again and again and again. But you also see them as really brilliant people who really love and adore her but are just in this hole they just can't get out of. Like, even for her they can't get out of it and as well as that just being like so exquisitely um, realized in the book she the sections on girlhood are amazing so um, T. Kira Madden is queer and in these sections 
Um, she makes a really close friendship with these other two girls and they put themselves in a lot of dangerous situations with men and they go out, they drink a lot, they do a lot of drugs and they get picked up a lot by men that are much older than them just to have something to do and they get this really thrill out of being in unsafe situations but throughout these sections you're aware that really she is lusting after the girls she's with rather than these men and it's, it's this unspoken thing they all know but she doesn't know how to like push the boundaries of it and then as you go through those sections um, that becomes something that's, that's more realised um, and she comes to terms with. I uh, highly recommend it. It is like exquisitely written. Every essay um, separately is phenomenal um, and would, would stand alone in a, in, a, in a collection of essays by other authors as amazing. Um, but as a collection, it's relentlessly brilliant. Like you finish one and you're like, whoa, like, and then you go to another and it just, it, yeah, it's amazing. You have to read it. And then funnily enough, the last two I have were, this first one is one of the first books I read. I think in fact, the first book I read in 2019. And the other one I have is one of the last books I read in 2019. Um, so this first one um, really, really stood the test of time. This is After the Eclipse, a memoir by Sarah Perry. This is a memoir about the fact that Sarah Perry's mother was murdered when Sarah Perry was quite a young girl, I think around 12 years old, and her mother was brutally murdered whilst Sarah was in the house. Sarah was in her bedroom and she overheard the attack and the murder. And it's her revisiting this as an adult, um, but what she wants to do is she wants to give another perspective to all this um, like, like true crime narrative that we've recently become obsessed with as people. She deals with her mother's life, who her mother is, um, f before she was born, the life her mother led, um, the way people viewed her, who her mother was to her as a mother, but who her mother remained as an individual even while she was Sarah's mother, up until the point of her mother's death, and then she also deals with what happened to her after the point of her mother's death, um, how she was handled by the detectives in the case, how her um, extended family treated her afterwards and how now as an adult she tries to move on. And um, many years after her mother's murder, no one had been arrested still. And you find out at the start that somebody will be many years later. So as you get towards the end of the book, that does happen. And um, it goes to the trial, they find out who did it and that person is arrested. But it's not the focus of the book, okay? Like the, the person who did it is irrelevant and that's what's beautiful or one of the beautiful things about this book is that in a lot of true crime now we put so much um, focus on the person who committed the crime, on who they were, on how they got to where they were, and whilst all that matters, because of course if these people hadn't had these awful things happen to them that made them do what they did, you know, other people wouldn't be hurt. So it's important and it's, and it's worth recognising. But I think a lot of the time in that gets lost who the victim was and the life they led. They just become this victim. The point she makes is how normalised it is for us to see um, like battered woman's bodies on the screen. Um, she's at the gym one day and she's on a running machine and there's widescreen TVs up and there's like daytime TV of um, like small true crime cases and she said it's completely normal just to see like a woman's body all over the screen. And that's become so normalised that we, we just see the body and we don't really, we see the body and maybe one photo of them smiling. Um, like in like a prom photo or a wedding photo and then other than that like we don't really know anything about them we maybe see some crying family members being like oh you know they were wonderful people but it doesn't delve any deeper than that and in fact it delves into who the the um, perpetrator was and what she does in this book is she successfully tackles the way we view true crime um, she brilliantly handles the way the detectives treat her the the questions they ask which are the wrong questions to ask um, her as a child, as a, as a survivor of this attack, and uh, in massive part, this is a love letter to her mother. I'm saying this and realising that I've just spoke about two books which were in massive part love letters to mothers, um, because the Saeed Jones book, God, he loves his mother, um, and you love his mother too by the end. Tira K. Batten's book, um, as I said, is a love letter to both her mother and father, and in fact, at the reading I'll link, her mother is in attendance. Um, this is massively a mother letter, a uh, love letter to her mother, which, like, just please read it. This is, like I said, the first book I read this year, and it's stuck with me. Like, I'd happily just pick it up and read it again now. I would with all of these, but like, yeah, I've thought about it so much since I finished it. 
And then this last one is also in part a love letter to his mother. So this is Heavy, an American memoir by Kiese Lehman. It is fucking brilliant. It's such a good book. Um, like, God. And I think it's really recognised as that because it's got phenomenally high rating on Goodreads. It's like 4.40, which is, you know, fairly unheard of for um, a book that isn't like fantasy or YA, I think. So I think most people agree, if they've read this, that this is brilliant. So initially he was contacted by his publisher and they asked him to write a book about his journey with his weight. Um, he's from Mississippi and he says in the interviews that in, in like, you know, if you're going to generalise that um, black people in Mississippi have quite a poor diet, very high in carbohydrates and sugars, and he has a real toxic relationship with his weight and with how heavy he is. And so he wanted to write a book um, about what he ate and what his mother and his grandmother ate um, and tell the story of their diet and who they were as people through that. And he started writing it and he just thought, I just, this isn't working for me, like, I don't really care. And what he ended up writing instead is a book about, okay, about physical heaviness and about how the way he presents himself um, makes him more feared by people because he's six foot one He's a black man in America, um, and at points he's weighed over 300 pounds. So he's, you know, um, in a lot of eyes um, in America, he is um, an imposing, um, scary, intimidating figure. There's a moment where he's walking home and he um, knows he has to go through the car park in his apartment and he sees a white woman about to get off her car and go up to her apartment. And so he waits outside because he knows that if he walks in, to his own apartment block, he's going to scare her. Um, just by being who he is, she's going to fear for her life, so he waits outside. Um, so what this becomes is instead a memoir about um, yeah, physical heaviness, but mainly about emotional heaviness. And what I mean by that is he delves into who his grandmother was, who his mother was, and who he became because of them. So his mother was um, physically violent. There's lots of domestic abuse in this. Um, she whips him a lot and you get told that a lot it's not easy to read but it's still a love letter to her because she was abused she was in a re very abusive relationship and she sort of takes it out on him but, uh, a big portion of the discussion in this book is the fact that she says when she hurts him that she's doing it because if she doesn't white people will hurt him more so every time he fails in her eyes by doing something that is completely normal for any child to do she will say as a black boy you have to be better than them you have to be the best and if you're not they will kill you they will destroy you and so every time he does something that she views as something that could um, make him be viewed in a negative light that could be connected to his race, she, she beats him. And it's this awful um, thought process, um, but it's one he grows up with, and he, he, as an adult, doesn't believe in any of that, and he's now articulated how he thinks it was actually really oppressive that she thought that, and actually it's, it's a little bit um, inherently racist to believe that, to believe that, that certain races have to be better than others in order to be equal. And it is beautiful. Um, as I said in my review video, there's a, so this is chronological um, and you get all the way up into him being a professor at college and how he feels about that, that's brilliantly articulated and how he gets a bit too close to his students and he depends on them too much because he's really distanced himself from his family and there's lots of discussions about him and his mother becoming um, really addicted to gambling, um, his struggles with weight, so this is, um, this has trigger warnings for like compulsive overeating but also for um, anorexia and like compulsive exercising and it's just absolutely brilliant and there's a section where he's a teenage boy and he gets sent from a predominantly um, School that's predominantly um, African-American students to a predominantly white school and him and his friend are the only black boys in their class and they learn <laughs> loads of um, their vocabulary starts to get bigger and they purposefully use um, vocabulary that you wouldn't usually hear children of their age use in order to sort of um, mock the the white people in particular the white teachers that surround them um, and something I absolutely loved, which he then carries through the memoir, is that they start to call white people and the way white people treat them meagre. And they start to talk about that black abundance. And 
they make loads of jokes about it, which are sort of dark jokes, but then it carries through the rest of the memoir. So for the rest of the book, he talks about how meagre white people are um, in their treatment towards people of colour and how he sees this beautiful black abundance that he's unwilling to, to minimise in order to, to live. Um, so this is unique for me and that it's actually a very masculine book. Um, Kiese Lehmann, when he talks in his interviews, he's very aware of his privilege as a man, but he also, throughout his life, um, is aware that he's never tried to make himself be safe. He's aware he's a target and he refuses to be anything other than who he is. There are situations where he's been pulled over by the police and every other black person in that car has gone quiet and been polite and said yes sir, no sir, and he refuses. And so in a lot of ways this book is about this masculinity that he inhabits, um, which I don't tend to read about, but I found like fascinating and loved. So yeah, just it, it's absolutely brilliant. So as I said, I think I had like an amazing year, like these books, uh, I love them all so, so much. And like I said, I had a really amazing non-fiction year. I really love the fiction. I'd really like you to read those as well. Um, but I think what I've really realised this year is that I bloody love memoirs. And so I'm going to read so many more this year, um, in 2020. So let me know if you've read any of these books. Um, please let me know if you plan on reading them. And also let me know if you have any recommendations for books like these ones. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.